Welcome to the August 15th Beehive Production user call. We have Rod, Andrew, Emil, Hans, Eva, Jan, Mark, and myself, Michael. And Hans, it sounds like you have some updates on your work. Yes, I've done it. <laughs> You've done so, it. Wait, that was uh, supposed to take some time. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> yeah, uh, I've implemented a software GPM backend, which wasn't that hard. The hard part was in debugging it and figuring out where... The software TPM differs from a real TPM as in it's much stricter as in what it accepts. Um, so I had to fix a couple of bugs in the existing code. Um, but after four days of work, I have something to show if you want to see it. Uh, we would love to see it, yes. <laughs> yes, is, sir. Uh, rather old-fashioned method of screen sharing that I'm using, if that is working. Uh, I can stop sharing, gladly. Can you skip my my terminal? Um, so I can do this. Oh, you're just holding up over video. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, sure, great. Oh, I'm guilty of as charged. Everyone, go ahead and pin his. his so if you, uh, I'm telling you, technology is the best solution. Yeah. So <laughs> if you can read that, the whole thing is tequila. Um, then you just do you 120. No. Um. So this is a command line to start software TPM. So basically, I wanted uh, to use a socket interface. I'm giving you a, a TPM state, which is the actual storage for the TPM. I tell it it's a TPM2. I want it to be a server. Um, I give it a socket path and log file to standard error in this case. And I don't know what this flag is needed for, but apparently it's needed. So start this. Uh, over here, we have a serial console of a VM, and then we start a VM. Or maybe you just look at the VM configuration. Okay. That's the part that is new. Um, if you see it in a second to last line, um, it looks similar to what you would use for a password, except that you say uh, SWTPM and pass it to socket. And so uh, that's... I... yeah, so the path is just uh, the listening uh, address of a Unix socket. Yes. Okay. Good. So if start this. Um, well, it takes a second on this reacting on, and then you can see the loader, and you can see FreeBSD starting, and if you look closely, you've probably just seen the kernel message that there's a TPM CRB0 at ACPI. <laughs> Did you get a chance to test if, if your emulation makes Windows 11 happy? No, <laughs> I don't have Windows here. And I wanted to keep my work to the minimum. Um, so if I'm scrolling up here, you can see the message from the kernel. Yes. Uh... Where is it? There it is. EPN CRB0. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, okay. This is my fault. I have one question. What happens yeah. when the TPM server process dies? Can you reconnect? No. Right now, you can't. Because uh, especially once you're in capability mode, that's a problem to reconnect. Um, so maybe it would be better to give it a directory path so that you could open at the... Let me finish. I don't know if we can talk about its yeah, shortcomings. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm telling the TPM tools to use staff TPM to zero because that's where it is. And then I have TPM startup. Actually, that's not really necessary. Um, because the kernel does this, the, the UEFI firmware does this, but one thing that works is I can read the PCRs of the TPM and I'm getting a boatload of keys and hashes and whatnot. And that is about as much testing as I have done with this. Yeah, but it seems to work. Thank so, you for tackling that. That is um, awesome. Could you show mm -hmm. the config syntax? Um, the config syntax of the the, of the, the VM, right? which is the yeah, there exactly that. Um, pass through yeah. and it T, SWTPM seems redundant for TPM, so maybe uh, software or 
emulated well, or something. The same the same device name as the pass through. Yeah, because it's carrying yep. most of the code. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but then maybe that should be a little more uh, disambiguated or or what well, do we what's the QEMU syntax? Is it SWTPM? I have no idea what the QMU syntax is. Okay. Um, so based on a, on a structure of Beehive code, I have to tell it somehow what backend it has to use, what emulation it has oh, to no use. No question. So, I'm just question. thinking of the naming of that, if it should be yeah. instead of SWTPM, because it's already TPM, it should just be either software or emule or something. Yeah. Any other opinions on that? Any, anyway, uh, that's, that's, I guess, fantastic either way. <laughs> Yes. So, speaking about the demon that can actually die, and uh, if if you look at this, this is the debug output from the from the software TPM. So you can see actually all reads and writes that were done, and I can just kill it. Yeah, and the VM continues to run until I do this, and then just a second. You can see that VM2 is stopped because, well, the TPM didn't uh, answer. Basically, that's a SIG pipe, something like that. It's handled a bit, bit better than, than a SIG pipe in the code. But so, what I originally wanted and would really like to do with this is that the Beehive process actually starts the uh, software TPM, forks and XX, the software TPM, and then connects to it. So in that case, if it dies, it can just restart it very um, easily. If you do this completely outside of Beehive's control, then uh, when the software TPM dies, we have to do some kind of error handling that we don't, that basically we put the device in a shutdown mode or something. I need to look at the TPM spec, whether that is possible. Treat it like a device failure. Um, yeah. So I'm actually looking at the Linux QEMU thing, and the, the process is called SWTPM, and the QEMU option to, to get to it is the way they show to do it is literally an emulated character device using a socket. Yeah. But that's that's because uh, on some systems, I guess Linux uh, is one of those, or is the only one, uh, the software TPM can create a character device in software. That's probably something that a Linux kernel does. And as far as I know, FreeBSD doesn't support it. I know for certain that Illumis doesn't. Well, the, the, the QEMU can, face can, and, can connect and, a character device to a socket. That's part of QEMU. That can, so you just, you literally, the software TPM is running with a socket open, and then you tell okay. QEMU to connect a character device to that socket. So FreeBSD has something called Q's character device from user space. Okay. Uh, so, so you, it's a kernel module you have to load. Once you have that, you have, it works a bit like Fuse, just that you have a user space character device. And you use it like a character device on the other end then. That's but the other option you should have is that you basically give, we have a command line to run, and then it would use uh, either a socket pay, uh, yeah, or a pi yeah, of pipes or whatever works best for your protocol. Um, and similar to P open with R plus. If you would expose the so, TPM as Qs or whatever you call it, and the character mm -hmm. device then that you can talk, it might just work to use pass through with that and treat it like a real device, or it might not. <laughs> so um, this socket thing. Um, will also work with the Lumas. This is basically the reason why I went this way. So as to not add a dependency on a feature that the Lumas doesn't have. Um, that doesn't mean that such a dependency or such a backend for whatever could be implemented or maybe password could be fixed to work directly with the with the queues so, backed by software TPM. The other thing is uh, if you don't want to make uh, Beehive, a kind of super server, which is problematic to do this restarting because Beehive, at least on FreeBSD, locks itself into capability mode using Capsacom. Okay. So that it, uh, one, at runtime, unless you uh, keep a child process which is created early, which could potentially also die, 
around uh, then you can't do arbitrary stuff because unlike uh, OpenBSD's pledge and unveil, Capsicum uh, is inherited across fork and exec. So once you're in capability mode, you're in capability mode for good. Yeah. Well, and, uh, there's several, several ways to do this and just running a daemon elsewhere, or if, if you wanted, you could probably just run it on a different machine and, and use a TCP connection. Um, that's yeah. definitely the way to do it right now. The daemon has to be started separately and configured separately. And exactly. And the good way to handle that, whatever problem you would have with the capability mode. Um, what one good way, in my opinion, to handle that would be to just let an arbitrary Unix socket super server, like for example, FreeBSD space system INET-D, handle the startup of. Beehive on demand, TPM emulator on demand, and the, you would then give it a directory and a socket name in the directory or a canonical socket name so that you just give it the directory path, it keeps the file descriptor to the directory, and then the server can restart. And so, if you so want you. to support that complexity, uh, I can also understand that you say no, they're tied together uh, and uh, if you kill it, you get a permanent mm -hmm. device failure until the guest is rebooted, which means the Beehive process terminates if a new one is created. So that that is obviously right. So what whatever happens to that daemon uh, if we can't continue crashing the VM is probably not a good idea. No, but that's not a good I idea. Whether it will help to just disable the device and continue running or not, I guess is uh, is debatable. But <laughs> there's there's little you can do in such a case if the if the uh, TPM daemon is, is external to Beehive. Um, that depends on if the just link uh, the software TPM library into Beehive and just uh, not use the daemon at all. Uh, that would be a lot more work than than what I did here. Yeah, but does the protocol support resetting the device or the device resetting itself in response to, for example, deep sleep in real hardware? If you suspend, does it then reset and you have to reinitialize it after waking up out of S3 or S4 state on a real machine? Yeah. Because also, that's also, already there. All kinds of headaches involved if you want to do um, live migration or anything like that. In that right, case, so... yeah, a TCP connection would actually be more useful, I think. But yeah, um, it's... a socket pair would be the yeah. You no, know, if you want to do live migration, you kind of have to add live migration to the device as well. So, so you would have. Got what this. if you did it with a non-connected oh. UDP socket? Excuse me, I didn't hear that. What if you did it with unconnected UDP? Um, I'm not sure that the, the software backend does actually support that, that uh, SWTPM is supported. As far as I understand, it supports Linux domain sockets, it supports TCP sockets, and that's about it. I and of course, protocol. direct the devices and user space and that kind of stuff. I should go look to see if, what VMware says about live migration when you're using VTPM. I mean, with, with this kind of daemon um, running, you could do all kinds of crazy stuff like connecting two machines to the same TPM. <laughs> hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> I, possibly I go wrong. What, what use case would be for that, but it should work. Um, uh, One of the use cases I could see for that would be uh, storing, for example, disk encryption keys in the mm -hmm. TPM and then having the uh, active passive uh, pair uh, use the TPM to get at the static disk encryption key, just configure it through TPM because noted as that is for this use case, it's already supported so that the TPM just gives you the key and then uh, both the active and the passive node come up and if you have just one soft TPM, you can't have 
conflicting states in the TPM. But of course, it probably totally breaks the assumption of the emulated interface, and you get even worse problems. <laughs> well, could the TPM be set read only to multiple machines? I could see how that might be useful. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, well, hey, it's early <laughs> days, but so far so good. Lots of stuff you can do with them, and uh, I, I don't claim to fully understand uh, the TPM spec. No I, worries. Half of it, probably. Um, From the history of exploits, I get the impression the hardware TPM implementers don't understand this spec either. <laughs> so you're in good company. <laughs> If, uh, if you're running uh, this uh, FWTPM software, there are options to encrypt the uh, TPM2 state. And um, if you wanted to run it over TCP, I guess you could wrap it in, well, I don't know. Is, is, is it a problem if someone can, can look at uh, the connection that you have with a software TPM and intercept it or modify it in between? Probably yes. So if oh, yes. Over a network, you probably want to use route that through some sort of encryption like an open SSL tunnel or anything. So there's plenty of issues here that I didn't I didn't even look at at all. So um yeah but we have a working prototype. Cool. And... Thank you. Great work. Don't let that get lost in the mix. <laughs> that is fantastic. Right. Well, take I'm, this gonna... From here. I'm gonna suggest a quick look at VMware's VTPM device back stuff there's a couple of good points in there they actually use a separated encryption server process for key management the tpm data itself is actually stored in the host nvram file so it's a per vm data set and it's it's uh it's encrypted by vm encryption and you can in fact v motion or transparently migrate machines with VTPMs. Okay. And this has, I mean, that's how the, I understand how they did it now. So for now, you can set up uh, SWTPM whatever way you like. I put the uh, state files and a log file and a socket into a directory where I keep the VM configuration and, uh, and the log files for the VM. Um, if I wanted to and had the hardware to do that, I could probably encrypt that and um, store the keys in a hardware TPM. Yeah, they do or... not specifically do that. VMware specifically stayed away from that. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, um, or live migration, maybe? Probably. So, OK. The, the current implementation is, is, is limited to these uh, Unix domain sockets and doesn't handle server errors. That's the two big limitations that, that it has. Other than that, it seems to work. So um, the SWTPM uh, repository I linked to already mentioned uh, queues uh, for Linux. So it uh, may be trivial to add the Right, includes and defines to make it use queues on FreeBSD as well. Yeah. <laughs> There's Jan's link. If that's the same implementation. That's the software I've been using, yes. That is what it is. And yes, it supports queues and uh, it has a chart of option, whatever that does. It probably emulates as a daemon the chardef as the same as the normal kernel driver does, so that something from user space like Beehive can just consume the emulated character device if it can consume a real character device. Well, so just people... to each other does not necessarily mean that it will work. Just, just because the Beehive process will be able to talk to the SWTPM uh, in case it's using pass through with a character device, so it doesn't. That not that does not necessarily work. Uh, mean that it will work. There are a couple of issues that I had um, with the common code in, in TPM. I maybe not okay. fix. I, I need to look at that. I haven't, I haven't tried that at all. Yeah. 
because uh, Qs is already used, for example, to emulate uh, Linux uh, webcam drivers in FreeBSD, so that you have a user space daemon which presents the API used by uh, Linux webcam drivers, and then you have a character device in FreeBSD, so which you can then use with something like uh, MPV, FFmpeg. It's quite neat if you need it. Because so, from a user's perspective, I suggest we, if any, take a quick look at what VMware does, do a quick look at what QEMU does, and think about the syntax, like the naming SWTPM after TPM seems redundant to me, but maybe there's something super memorable that, or might be consistent mm -hmm. with another Beehive device where it's in that syntax. I think... Hans, aren't you using the name SWTPM because that's the software you're using that you basically ported the Linux software TPM over? No, that's a software TPM version that has BSD license and is used on Linux and used on FreeBSD and you can use it pretty much everywhere else, I think. So I didn't that's the firmware out of IBM, right? Yeah, plus some extras. I did take a look at the code when I was debugging stuff, but yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the core of it seems to be coming from IBM. Regarding syntax, if you want someone bike shedding all over it, maybe well, it would be nice to have uh, the TPM and then Chardev or uh, Socket. Um, CDF for Socket as option and then okay. the path. Just rename it to Socket and then we'll have a Socket there. Uh, if someone implements a different TPM server that uses a socket, and hopefully that's yep. consistent then. And if not, it's not our problem. I mean, <laughs> that's one way to do it. Just call it socket. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a path to a socket. Yeah, or it you can get more flexible. Uh, SWTPM uses and call it Unix IO, which is their way to call it a Unix domain socket. Um, you could. Well, but really from the structure of the code in in Beehive itself, SWTPM made sense because that's the backend that it okay. is where Fair all enough. the, the uh, special stuff is happening. And if you want to add more features, like instead of giving it a path to socket, we want to give it a IP address and a port number, we can probably do that. It's not too hard. Or we could pass it a complete command line to start a WPTPM itself or anything like that. That would be neat because then you don't have to deal with uh, file system name as because the problem with a Unix socket is uh, that you need a writable directory to bind it into. And if you run it as a command, you could use the socket pair system call to create a pair of Unix sockets, which are already pre-connected. I would still have to give a path to that socket to SWTPM when I run it. Does it so. accept something like uh, a dash for STDIO or something? Mm. So that it doesn't bind, but just uses an existing bar connected That's, socket? I'm just a matter of experimenting with it. So ideally, if, if, I, if I had my way, I would have just done it in a way where I can start uh, SWTPM from Beehive and just uh, use a pipe or something. Don't bother with the socket thing at all. But that's not how it works. So, yeah. Um, Ava, would you like to vocalize your observations? Possibly. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, great. You have I've the floor. I've been fighting with the microphone oh. all morning. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, with the live migration with. VMware, what I've seen is that it has a success rate that is relatively low and probably we don't want to emulate how they're emulating the TPM. Uh, but having that as a feature for live migration, I think would be more appropriate to look at how Zen handles it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, we may get some former VMware users 
you know, since the their whole recent change going on. Yep. And so it would be good to have feature parity with them as much as possible, which I think we can. Um, having emulated software devices like this is a certain, certainly an important step in that direction. What do you know about the Zen implementation? Oh gosh, um, let's see. Predictable, sorry. I'll have to go look for my notes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was looking at the source a couple of weeks ago, but I don't ah. have it memorized. Uh, Hans, one, awesome, thank you. Two, we're here to help, not bike shed this. So what is next for you? And we have some people here with various experience on PPMs in different environments. Uh, well, how can we help just, you best? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's two things about this. First, as a contractor, I want to make a living of this work. Ah, okay. <laughs> I uh, if, if I'm going to uh, have this reviewed and integrated in FreeBSD and we were talking about that, I probably could use help or at least a pointer to the right documentation uh, how the FreeBSD review process works. Where do I go and how do I do that and who do I need to talk to? Ah, that's that, the kind of hold that thought because we touched on it just before the recording and we might want to circle back to that before. The end. So hold that thought. Uh, what's the other? What are the other aspects? Well, the major aspect is if I continue this work, uh, we need to figure out how do I get paid for it. Okay. But frankly, of course. Well, we've sent some, and I know Andrew's company is interested, yeah. and uh, it's a, often yeah. a chicken and egg oh. issue, such that without any notion of hope like no prototype, people aren't very interested. Having a prototype, as you've just demonstrated, is a huge step forward because it's a whole lot of non-zero progress. So um, yes, this is exactly what the first step looks like. So uh, that's something we can talk about offline, but um, fantastic. Yeah. So, and then I suppose that gets immediately uh, circular back to the review process looking like uh, something. So uh anything if we circle back later on the review process anything else at this time beyond oh my gosh thank you let's let's uh go move forward uh no it's just really okay uh do you, are you able to stick around for the next you know half hour or so while we go through this Certainly. great uh let's talk about this one because that is been that issue keeps coming up the documentation is good, but not great. And I want to document things like Rod had the, the five W's, et cetera. So we'll touch on that a little later because I have my opinions. Everyone has their opinions. Yay. Uh, let's shift gears to Mark. Mark, you were having VNC issues where, for example, there were color shift issues on Beehive and perhaps TrueNAS and uh, no VNC. Um, so I wasn't having having issues. Okay. It's because someone brought it up that I looked into it. Um, the, the, the link that I uh, just just gave you shows it is a um, Zlib implementation for no VNC. Okay. Uh, right now it, it uh, defaults to raw as the, as the common encoding, which has performance issues, uh, you know, just the amount of data that it, that it uh, sends across the wire. So this would, this doesn't fix the color issue. That's going to be a beehive change that I'll submit later. Okay, but this improves performance. Yeah. Awesome. Um. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to scroll here. Okay. So there you go. Um. Anything from the rest of us at this time? Um, oh, what do I do? Fight, fighting with this. Uh, okay, any questions from the group for Mark? Uh, I can't play. Yes. Uh, why is it that no VNC doesn't support any other compression? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 does, it does support the numerous other compression techniques. It's just the Beehive only supports raw 
and Zlib. Okay, then I guess the question is, why are we only supporting raw and Zlib in Bihar? Well, yeah, I, I, I thought about, you know, implementing another encoding scheme within Beehive, but then it's going to take a while for it to get out into the various releases. Whereas I figured that uh, no VNC, this was a gap in their offering and they could probably release faster than we could. Is there an obvious one that we retroactively should have had for a very long time? Um, <clears throat> you know, there's probably CRLE uh, or the tight encodings. Okay. Uh... I think LD4 is another one that is popular. How's Tithe spelled? T I G. Uh, yeah. Oh, I. You spoke over each other. How's that go? Or type it in chat, just anyway. Um, thank you. Tight. Oh, tight. Yeah, and then a, quick, was, a quick survey tells me that, that Zlib was probably one of the most common early VNC encoding algorithms, and the fact that no VNC left it out is an oversight on their part. Okay, well, then we have the right thing at the right time, yeah. better late than ever. Awesome. Um, and if it doesn't change our back end, then that's huge progress. Uh, Jan, you made a comment on the color issues. It sounds like, Mark, you do have something to work on there. Yeah, they, awesome. it works on my system. I just need to clean up the, the patch a little bit. OK, that is fantastic. Another slight issue which came up repeatedly is that some clients, like, for example, the one built into Mac OS X, doesn't uh, like the Beehive server unless you set a password. Correct. Uh, Antrenig talked to them and they actually said, yeah, we can undo that requirement. So apparently that will be in some version of. Um, is there a free, free BC bug on that? The bug is that macOS client requires a password to speak VNC. Otherwise, it will just say invalid because it, yeah. Yeah, I. but my point is, is there a, a bug in bugs.freebsd.org that has a reprodu reproducible test case? It's kind of not our problem, I suppose. It's a Mac OS problem. If... The oh. question is what Mac OS does. If, if I don't know the VNC protocol well enough, but to be sure, but I think there's there's a difference between not authenticating and authenticating with an empty password. If Apple does attempt to authenticate with a password and sends the empty password string, the protocol allows that to be encoded, then the FreeBSD Beehive VNC server could, if no password is configured, allow authentication with an empty password and any username or something like that. And that may be enough to make macOS happy and doesn't increase the attack scenario at all because an attacker could already not send a login. So that's how they uh, disagree on, on how to implement the protocol. That's something you should probably be able to see in WireGuard, uh, sorry, in Wireshark. Hmm. Well, so to, to a point I believe I heard Rod say er, early in this meeting is, it's good to be able to document how to reproduce some of these issues, file it as a bug, and that way, you know, if someone has an interest, they can pick it up and uh, do a do a proper diagnosis of it. It's very valuable if those uh, bug reports have something that amounts to a reproducer shell script. So install your fresh FreeBSD system and run this shell script to reproduce. I know. I I'm I'm just trying to say. It, it's nice to have formalization of these uh, bugs. Behavior. Acting okay. okay, I was just going to mention that I posted that there. Thank you. Yeah, what is it? Uh, that's that's the VNC protocol version 3.8. Oh, OK, cool. Which I trust is what Beehive is implementing. 
protocol level wise? I don't believe it implements 3.8. I think it implements VNT2. Ah. Uh, yeah, three, so three I find a bug a report. Fairly recent one. It, Sorry, it, John. It tries to emulate 3.738 three, and some backward 3.3. Somebody's worked on it. I found a bug report from uh, 2020 uh, about that and pasted the link to the chat. Yeah, what's that? Oh, so we're at three points. What? What? Where are we at? Uh, Mark, what's the link level at the moment? Three seven three eight and some backward to three three. Three eight. Three eight. And... I... But the you know the reality is that it's a minimal VNC implementation. Yeah. It always has been and follows the initial beehive mantra of the shortest path to a and working prototype and <laughs> leave it to the people on this call to clean up the rest. Um, okay, support and that's their updated frame buffer. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Go to three, the three. bottom and you get a, a table of results. Oh, cool. Loading, loading. Oh, with the different clients. Oh, very nice. Oh, good. Because that's come up over the years of like, okay, well, we're having issues with one, try another, etc. Very nice. Okay. Um, just to inject it. BMD, the Beehive uh, Management uh, or Supervision Daemon, through its plugin interface, already has support for announcing the VNC services uh, via MDNS for Avahi. And then you can just on a Mac on the same uh, segment, or you, if you have a proper MDNS forwarding, just find it in your network environment by name, click, and then connect through the share screen. Setting as if you're connecting to a Mac. Hmm. With screen sharing enabled to VNC. That's quite uh, handy. So if you have a lab at home and you have your FreeBSD box and the Beehive uh, server processes are bridged to your home network, then you just bind it. It announces it through a Vahi on your FreeBSD, uh, sorry, Beehive, not shared host. And you can auto discover them, you don't even have to type in VIP addresses anymore. So VMD has that? VMD has the, it's a plugin, but it's available for as port, so. So VMD with a B or V as in Chris's? VMD. Or... I, I missed uh, it. Victor or Beta? Thank you, BMD. Thank you. Uh, note. Is that accurate? So, okay. uh, speaking of which, Jan, you say there is a an update to Yuichiro's uh, BMD project. What would happen? Yes. That was supposed to be a click on a link. Let's try this again. So he made a new major release with a few new features. Hello. He extended the plugin interface, um, including support for having plugins to interface with loadup. This um, it now uh, no longer requires you to use bridged networking, but you can instead have it create a top interface without requiring to put it on a bridge, so that you can have a routed network configuration. Uh, hmm. The it follows again the this is kind of an opinionated. Beehive manager, so it has some logic in it. If you configure any pass-through device, it automatically wires the guest memory because otherwise pass-through cannot work. Mm -hmm. He added support for Veil and added the, the option to pass through the um, cache, no cache, direct uh, read-only options to disks and yeah. Yep. I'll and to just... set the MAC address of network interfaces. Um, uh, uh, it would be great to know what his user base looks like. I hope it's not a project and project leader of one and user base of one, but he's done an amazing amount of work. 
during lockdown and here's the result. So he's still at it and uh, that is compelling. Yep. Cool. I hope he can uh, join a call at some point. We had to do a special hours time zone oriented uh, a time zone aware call to get him. <laughs> but super nice guy and he was in Taipei. Uh, so just punching through the list, it seems Steve Wills has produced, I forget who pointed this out, but, uh, Serena, Serena, that is a loading thing. Four days ago, somebody is active. Okay. Let's take a look at how he describes this. A Go-based uh, beehive management suite. Okay. Um, has anyone tried this? Not me. And it looks like it needs some kind of controller, which is not part of that repository, because something has to send the gRPC calls. Hmm. Uh, tell us about gRPC call. That's a Go based or it's not just call. Go. It's a, a fast HTTP free based, initially quick based uh, RPC protocol. Uh, think of it as you know, a schema based language. Where you write down your uh, RPC interface, and then you can use it to compile this to bindings for different languages. Hmm. Fairly commonly used by Google and Go projects. The problem is that it requires a bunch of tooling and is fast a fast moving project. But hey. Uh, Mark, do tell what you got. <laughs> oh, I have, I have code to uh, re-implement uh, the BMP hive from shell to Go oh, interesting. Uh, fascinating. Uh, have to see about the... cleaning it up and uh, publishing it out. Okay. I'm still of the opinion that almost nothing in this, these Beehive supervisors is Beehive specific. And the real lack here is a general purpose service and manager and process supervisor in FreeBSD, which is more capable than just the daemon command. Correct, Yana. We've been, yeah, through And we have that. like half a dozen of them in ports and yeah. Well, maybe we can take a moment blessed. to determine if it's a question of extending daemon or choosing one and being done with that question. Because yes, uh, but this is conf this is impacted every single Beehive management project is what is the proper supervision model of the Beehive process because a, a VM may come and go unlike your most daemons you just want to boot yeah, start up yeah. start up and have and leave until shut down. My opinion the, the limitation which Beehive exemplifies is that you need more than just starting Beehive and restarting it depending on the exit state that you can do mm. with the daemon command. But what you need is the dependencies which also have to come up and down dynamically like creating the top interface, adding it to a bridge, creating the bridge the first time, um, hoping that it already exists in the host physical interfaces on the bridge or setting up the net graph, uh, network graph and modifying it as the VM changes, it starts up, starts down. Uh, my pet peeve is that I owe SCSI set up and tear down, which is very similar to the network startup and tear down. And the problem here is that you can do it all. Yes, you can even do it in shell, but it's ever prone, it's repetitive, it's everyone inventing their own wheel mm -hmm. uh, and coming up with a hexagon. Yep. Uh, let's see, Eva, you have a comment that might also be best vocalized, but I will com 
copy it because you've written it so elegantly, I will place that in there. Would be great to have a unified API for remote call exec execution. You're working on a REST controller for that purpose. Okay, um, um, anything to add to that? We have it, it's called SSHD. <laughs> well, Sorry, I'm sure it... there's a different motivation, you snarky bastard. Go ahead, Eva. <laughs> Eva, your microphone uh, is siloning out. It might need a, if it's USB, it might need a reboot. Classic USB mic trouble if it's USB. Sounds like a sampling rate issue. Or a sampling rate issue. Or a congested network. Or could just sit there. Each one of us have. Does our, anyone want to read her uh, comment out in the meantime? Like, oh, sheesh. Okay, I'll reread. Um, it would be great to have a unified API for remote call execution. I'm guessing exactly short for. I'm working on a REST controller for that purpose to hook VMB Hive and other vert hypervisors into a larger management framework for private cloud systems. Okay. Uh, when it rains, it pours. I, I'm. I'm <laughs> I'm impressed with all the Beehive development taking place and so, increasingly in the open. Yes. I was only partly jesting by suggesting SSH because the moment you have arbitrary remote command execution, encryption and authentication are hard problems and uh, it's hard to get acceptance for a new protocol past people, but SSH is already within their um, Parameter, so it's kind Muscle of muscle memory. Yes, yeah, it's accepted the risk of running an SSH server, mm -hmm. and it's trusted enough, which is, for example, why tools like Mosh piggyback on SSH. They set up an SSH session to establish a session key, send it over the SSH session, and then have just the symmetric part of session encryption to handle, and don't have to. Mm -hmm do user validation, authentication, authorization, accounting, because that's done by SSH. And if you don't have to solve the problem of latency and roaming, then you can just use yeah. the existing SSH connection. And it may be really useful to run similar to the SFTP server to implement an SSH subsystem. Just like the SFTP server used to be an external subsystem. So SSH has a mechanism built in for structured sub servers to run within it yeah, as okay. a child process. So Off that topic, but infrastructure yeah. really exists. And unless you have to make it HTTPS, it may be the way to go. Okay, noted. Okay, let's expand on, Eva has a motivation. Let's explore that. Eva, is your mic behaving? Yep, right. I... Oh, babe, it, maybe your mic went south and you've got some more text here. Just one sec. Um, Rod put in a point like too much trust in SSH. And I'm pretty sure I've heard the OpenBSD developer say, hey, we do not want a monopoly. We do not want to be, you know, the one game in town and have the internet kind of game over if, if it has trouble. Let me format here. So. The calls could go over SSH. That part is totally fine. The REST controller in this case is only intended to unify the command structure from disparate hypervisors. So yes, you have a private cloud of different hypervisors and uh, variety is a good thing, then uh, understood. So Ava, is that indeed a project in some state of completion or otherwise, and it sounds like you have to take off. No worries. Thank you for joining and keep us posted. How about that? Okay. And let's talk VPP also in chat there. So was it Jan, you see that VPP revealed a bug in Vail? Um, not in Vail, but in Netlink generic, which is basically how, uh, sorry, not Netlink, Netgraph. Um, sorry. Not Netgraph, nope. NetMap. <laughs> NetMap. Too, now okay. you've gotten me confused as well. Hey, you. I mean, uh, but it's a NetMap is FreeBSD's API to move in the VPP parlance 
vectors of package quickly between uh, Nick and user space and back again. Mm -hmm. And the issue is that you can have full support in the driver or there is the option that there's a generic way where basically you have this emulated queue instead of using the hardware wing buffer, uh, which is still a lot better than going for something like a BPF uh, device or even worse, a tap device to move for packets. And then the nice thing about uh, NetMap is that it's there, it can be f very fast, and uh, VPP used to have support for it, but that bit rotted away, and they were storing that as part of the VPP port. But it turns okay, out in the NetMap room. generic, there used to be a bug in there if you don't have dedicated support for NetMap in your network card driver, and that means that during the yeah once the packet has been transmitted, and the batch of packets gets deallocated, each individual packets gets once deallocated from the batch and once individually from the netmap emulation. So you had a double free uh, of m buffs in the kernel, which triggered the panic. So we ran into and that. Kind of fits the behavior people have reported for Beehive that it works for some and not for others, and it crashes quickly under real load. Interesting. Do you um, have a PR for that? No, uh, there is no PR for that, I think, uh, right now. Okay. Because it's just something they're working on in current, and it may not even be upstreamed yet. Okay. But uh, Tom mentioned that in his uh, blog article. Got it. The one you uh, mentioned on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Here's the Brock article as a link. Thank you. I'll just say details. My I click and nothing happens. Please work. Okay. Ah, thank you. Copy. Okay, anything else related to VPP at this point? It's a new thing coming online. And as Jan pointed out, there are there is information on so, the Tuesday jail call. Yes. On Linux, um, VPP is one of the common and among the fastest ways to um, implement the virtual bridge on the host. Short of passing through virtual PCI functions, you have a special uh, server mode in VPP where it basically does similar to the soft DBM. It kind of emulates already the VIO uh, net device, including uh, TSO, LRO, um, interrupt, um, collation, and um, multi queue operations. So, all of that mm -hmm. is there in VPP. What you need to have, a f uh, including things FreeBSD right now can't use, like Linux uh, GSO, uh, uh, segmenting, offloading for things which aren't TCP. Hmm. Okay. And um, the problem is that Beehive's uh, BitIO net or Beehive's network backend uh, API is too primitive to exploit this feature completely because neither do we support uh, batching multiple packets nor do we support uh, multi queue okay. operation. Got it. So, but we now have a fast tested, at least on Linux, uh, data plane. To, for these features, once they're implemented, to test against so that we don't have to have a big bang scenario where you have to implement the rich side and the hypervisor side at the same point. Instead, we can reuse a feature which supposedly works well on Linux and only have to find out how to hook it into Beehive successfully. And we could finally break through the single digit gigabits per second barrier for non-pass-through interfaces. Got it. Uh, which is something uh, production users have repeatedly mentioned that the only yes, way sir. to really 
satisfactory network throughput is to use PCIe pass-through, which only works uh, if you have enough virtual functions on your NICs to pass through and uh, can live with um, boot time of the host virtual function configuration right now. Yeah. Okay, so with BPP in place, what's then the next task for the Beehive backend to properly interface and get the benefits? Um, use the, barely implement the Beehive side of what is already there in QEMO because QEMO has a special backend to okay. interface with VPP so that you do a, basically, if a packet arrives from the physical network, VPP intercepts it, bypasses the kernel network stack, bridges it, and sends it directly to user space uh, of the hypervisor. They okay. are in a pre mapped memory buffer so that you have like a single copy for a software bridge instead of half a dozen copies and almost as many context switches. Okay. Is that in Beehive itself or TAP or elsewhere? Um, Where does that it live? would be just like TAP or NetGraph in your backend type. Got it. Thank you. But to get the full advantages this can give us and the full path, we need to extend the, uh, the callbacks to implement a network device in Beehive because right now the API is not rich enough to express the feature set we need to get this performance. Yes. So the, the struct of function pointers needs to uh, change. Interesting. To have... So right now, uh, there's a function uh, call for e each packet and each packet is uh, passed as an IO vec array so that you can split off headers. But what we need is a vector, so an array of packets, not of pa pa one packet fragmented. Hmm. You can still have a vector of vectors, but um, potentially a v the, a VPP uh, makes use of hardware features to uh, basically keep one buffer of headers per protocol and then fragment this we need a way to um, take care, Mark. To process basically the different chains okay. as a vector again, so that you would have like Niovec, but knowing that you have a buffer behind that, so that you get good cache locality. But <laughs> okay. Um, First of all, we need a primitive implementation to just interface with this feature at all, and then we can talk about performance. Got it. But I'm bringing it up here already because yep. changing that uh, API is well, not too complex for uh, something which will impact all users of Beehive who treat FreeBSD as their upstream, so Solaris derived operating systems. So it should be brought up early and it could be that they already have something we could upstream to FreeBSD for the Viona work. So if we could get that under BSD license and because the performance numbers of up to 40 gigabits per second they mentioned, they reach indicate that they have to have at least some kind of batching and probably multi-key operation. Well, that I understand a lot of it's a solved problem over there. Exactly. Yeah. And if they've already done that, maybe it's better to take the interface upstream it. They don't have to maintain a patch. We get that feature. Yep. Yep. And everyone can be happy and we have a win 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 situation. <laughs> okay. Um Rodney, does that sound accurate on VPP and its future beehive integration? We need a device. And welcome, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, do you have any topics? We've covered a lot of ground. Take a peek. Uh, no, surprise. I'm absorbing. Well, you are of, awesome. Well, that's a good stuff today.
Uh, remember how you and I helped out Hans a wee bit on the software TPM? Well, we got a demo of it like 20 minutes ago. So thank you, Hans. And we can talk Ooh, about how can't to. wait to watch. I don't know if Exactly. I, yeah, It'll be. I think I walked in right after that. No worries. So again, thank you, Hans. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, watch the space. Anyway, uh, so Daniel, no topics. Um, because Emil and Hans are uh, new to, say, the FreeBSD review, reviewing industrial complex, we had some great chat before the recording, and uh, Rod had some input, I've got some input, and maybe you even have some input, and Jan and company on, hey, what can we tell participants? Um, the documentation is good, but not great. And if no one else has Beehive specific points, I say we jump into that. Um, I'm happy to give my little monologue, but Rod, you had some excellent materials. Shall I go or do you want to go? And you're muted. Okay. Uh, I will go briefly. So uh, I don't know if I, if someone wants to type some of this in, great. I will just say it. Reviews and PRs are a bit like conference talk proposals, big and small. You need to explain exactly what you are there to achieve. You have to justify your work. You have to explain previous work. You have to show your tests, show your science, and phrase things very accurately. Uh, a review that says, hey, fixes this thing, or a PR problem report in FreeBSD language, not pull request, that, oh, it's broke, will go nowhere. But, and this has come up actually with the uh, AMD IOMMUSRIOV issues that Santiago is having. The ticket that he found and started adding information to was not very descriptive and so it didn't get much attention so it, once the title was refactored well uh that got some better attention so let's see emil you are working on vert io fs fs uh, correct I'm, I'm tempted to say hey can you work on vert io sock in the future but that's a whole different conversation <laughs> but with vert io fs um i suppose looking at previous uh, reviews on new features like that. You can even just search for IO or Beehive and just see like add, I, you know, Rod can probably answer better here, like advert IOFS support to Beehive. Okay, that's super concise to the point. And you say, hey, this is a Vert IOFS implementation either derived from this or completely new or something and just basically catch the reader up as quickly as possible to what you're proposing so that they're not left with any questions right off the bat. Just just spell it out as absolutely clear as possible. And looking at the, at the attendees, we have primarily, well, maybe 50-50 non-native English speakers. So it's often a challenge to work exclusively and be communicative in a foreign language. So uh, there's my little soapbox rant in that if you need to go for some muscle memory, turn to your conference talk proposal muscle memory and just explain it. And it's like writing a, a, a college or high school paper and say, okay, this is what I do. Here's my science. And Rodney, if you're available. Chat GPT and... as copy editor. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> careful there uh also rodney you had the uh so michael rant little type michael rant uh rod was it the five w's the who what where why how um, from what grade school <laughs> who what where why how okay and yes Perhaps beyond you're upgrading the previous topic, which is good. Okay. Um, ah, yes, an email uh, is that, oh, directed from Jan. It's like, okay, distinguish. Um, mm -hmm. Let's just do that here. Uh, let's just do it wide open. Okay, I'll start typing. Um, so there has been some confusion uh, because one of the 
9 PFS for Fiat IO Beehive client attempts was called Fiat IO FS as the repository name. So oh. that's yes, the the Juniper one, one right? The, the Juniper one. They called it Fiat IO FS on the GitHub repository. Just the repository name. They clearly stated 9 PFS in the readme or P9 FS mm -hmm. because it has to be a valid symbol, but uh. This created a lot of confusion among mailing list posts that vidiofs and 9pfs are the same, which we aren't, and you're probably in a better position than anyone else in this call to explain the difference and advantages of using the fuse-like interface instead of the 9p over non-TCP transport. Mm -hmm. I see. I didn't know about the, the initial name of P9FS because I only saw it when it uh, landed and it was always like very, I guess, because it was confusing initially, they added the P9 like very prominently on every uh, file. Uh, in that case, yeah, we, I thought that, uh, okay, that, that was confusing on my part then. I thought it was like already essentially kind of clear. I'll make it clearer in the in the PR that this is a new device and that this is something that we need because Sometimes we run on hosts that have one but not the other. And of course, like, like VertiOFS also has the option of zero copy pass through eventually once we get to that point, which will make it faster. Does the fuse interface in theory also support interesting Sorry? but yeah. dangerous things like um, Unix sockets in a VertiOFS or even character devices? Uh, so, uh, do you mean on the Beehive side? Essentially, uh, when we emulate a VirtiOFS interface from Beehive, can we do various things like, you know, have something that's not a bind bound? Is that what you're referring to? Um, the maybe crazy question that appeared in my mind is could this VirtiOFS be used to? tunnel basically Unix sockets bound to the server to into the guest so that you could, using the VidIOFS mount, connect mm -hmm. to a Unix socket or does Fuse not uh, offer that feature or at least this version of Fuse not? So the nice thing about Fuse is that there is a ton of, I think there's more Fuse servers than P9 servers too. So the nice thing about Fuse servers is that they, as long as we make it like the current patch is only the FreeBSD guest side. So essentially the use cases we're running on Linux or on WSL, and then we want to use their Vita UFS servers that are already there. And therefore we, we use the Vita, the device driver inside the, the FreeBSD guest to be able to share data with the host. Uh, what you're referring to is that it's very possible. Like if we build the Beehive side, like essentially if we have something like an open Unix socket, right, on the Beehive side, and then we have a basic stub device that is able to essentially translate from, from Fuse messages to VirtIO messages uh, that, uh, and do the, dev uh, the VirtIO device emulation, then we can hook in any few server we want in the, in the, on the host side and then have it communicate with the guest and the guest doesn't know the difference. It thinks that it's a regular file system. Like we could very well do something, I don't know, like SSHFS or something, right? And have uh, well, be able to, to mount. It wasn't directly what I was thinking about, oh. but I think I've, your answer kind of answered it for me because the guest kernel, of course, would create a local Unix socket and not uh, in the mount point and just use the path and not uh, delegate the socket operations to the file system because no file system implements the Unix socket in the file system more than just the inode. Uh, the IPC isn't done through the file system layer. So I what I, I was thinking about of kind of having a, some kind of mechanism to share sockets without having to implement VSOC uh, does, doesn't work. Hmm. So wow. it cannot work because that's just not how file systems work. It was just yeah. me confusing myself. I say no. I I'm like trying to understand. I th I think you're right in that. I think that it's 
it wouldn't um yeah uh i don't think like a socket like thing really what was that about sshfs is that from a vm or root on sshfs or something satanic And I've lost audio. Uh oh. Hmm. Michael? Sorry. Okay. Uh, maybe I'm back. back. <laughs> yeah, that went You're very back? south. I got, I got completely disconnected. Sorry about that. Um. Oh, video's back. I guess I don't need to have. Um. My apologies. So we lost the recording for a second. Cut. Yes, cut. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, just one moment. Okay, there's the screen. Yeah, I lost complete Wi-Fi up front with our new mesh-based router from last night. So I guess life is not perfect. Um, What did I miss? I had asked a question about SSHFS. I saw Emil's mic bouncing and then... Right now, with your uh, with IOFS, are you basically interfacing with an existing uh, fuse server, or uh, it, oh. so the fuse server would be on something like SSHFS with an alternative libfuse, or um, do you intend so, to patch libfuse, or? Um, would it so be a loop-like of... thing in the host kernel? Uh, so in the host right now, I haven't uh, done any work on the device emulation side. So on BHAB itself, I've, I have just have done the uh, kernel driver that you need for the guest. So BHAB itself cannot really emulate with IOFS yet. On this is so we would need something like, for example, a, a Linux host that already has some kind of uh, Verta IOFS device. Uh, now, the device, the, the server that I'm using for Verta IOFS on Linux is the standard one that's packaged with every uh, with every uh, every distribution I've seen. Like I've used both with Arch and with Debian, and it is basically a bind bound fuse server. Uh, that thing has the that it doesn't really so that. Server, as far as I can tell, first of all, they completely wrote it in Rust, so uh, it's essentially just from the. Uh, I don't think it uses any, like regular libfuse. Uh, what it does is it has two components. It has one component that is uh, that allows it to read from those virtu uh, from those uh, virtio virtues, and then deserialize the data into uh, fuse messages. And the rest of the server is just a regular fuse server. So um, my point about SSHFS and about any other servers is that we could very like if we when we build it for Beehive, we could very well have the deserialization part and then yeah, couple it kind of loosely with the actual fuse server implementation. So therefore, like there is a small component that grabs those VTIO messages and then deserial like passes them into fuse. And then sends the day, sends the fuse messages maybe through a uh, through a Unix socket to some fuse server, and that would be relatively straightforward, I think. Like I cannot think of any reason why this would be difficult. Just wondering. So if mm -hmm. you start a normal fuse server right now on a FreeBSD system, new hypervisor mm -hmm. involved, you, the fuse server creates a fuse device. Yes. And that you can then mount on the system like any other device, more or less? Pretty much, yeah. Like the, and the mm -hmm. So once we have the fuse device, but have not yet mounted it, mm -hmm. shouldn't it then be possible to kind of have this password device be a proxy of all the messages you would, and I opted, you would normally send uh, through the fuse device, then get mm -hmm. kind of, marshaled through the uh, VidIO ring buffers to the guest, mm -hmm. and there uh, if also a fuse device is created, mm -hmm. uh, or 
so that it looks like just a fuse file system, which is already the fuse device exists, so you can just mount it to the gas. And no socket involved. Yes. Uh, Why yeah, would this you is what... do the indirection of going through another socket again? Sorry, I, I lost you on the last part. Like everything you're describing is basically how it's built right now, right? Like yeah, normally okay. you have a fuse device and you mount it. Here we have mm -hmm. a virtual IO device and we mount it. And the only difference is who's consuming the, the fuse messages, basically. Yes. Does, um, does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you need something to basically in the kernel to make kind of a fuse client device for Beehive. Uh, to turn that back around so that fuse can consume that so existing fuse server or you how does that work? I so you're talking about the host side here, right? Like after we send the messages through Virtio, we need something to read that. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes. If you so, want to interface with existing few servers mm -hmm. directly so that you can run SSHFS on a host, on a, mm -hmm. the hypervisor host, and mm -hmm. mount it in, a uh, in the guest. That's exactly. kind of how I would see that. But what yeah. I have found, if I understood, they are quite um, terse and spotty documentation correctly. It looks like all that they're implementing right now in the Rust backend is mm -hmm. Take a path on the host and then mm -hmm. run basically a pass through loop like device. And mm -hmm. now it's support for wrapping arbitrary fuse servers mm -hmm. to re export. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, uh, the implementation they have is really bare bones. Like, and in fact, I can, so I have, I have this edge case that I'm looking into where we can actually crash the server on the host by mm -hmm. sending an by interrupting uh, a message sent on the guest which i don't know if that's expected by them like they assume a crash fault thing where even some like when something is unexpected they you know they just stop the entire thing but in general i think that a lot of the like it's a relative it's as simple as can be essentially like Which the, makes and, sense. Yeah. It's, uh, but I think that if they had like decoupled it, like this is how you could, I think this is what you're saying too, like if I'm understanding correctly. Like if they had built it in two pieces, you could very well add any server. I mean, yeah, I obviously like that said. The I think the I'll... motivation mm -hmm. here isn't to wrap any server for them. If I understand their motivation correctly, their motivation appears to me to be that they want uh, to have something which is reasonably close to the guest kernel's virtual file system API so that you have mm -hmm. less of an uh, impedance mismatch between the, the guest kernel's VFS and the protocol, uh, which is one of the problems we have, for example, with the 9P server, that, the, um, that 9P was designed to support Plan 9, not a modern Unix. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, it's a stateful protocol where you have these file handles and you have to mm -hmm. statefully match them, uh, which mm -hmm. creates a problem because the VFS doesn't track that well because if you have the split between the uh, inode, vnode, file opening, file descriptor, and then the process file descriptor table. Mm -hmm. And all of these interactions handle that in a Unix socket, and that means that the uh, VFS API is kind of stateless. Yeah. And they, they doesn't preserve like that action. step, which is what one of the big remaining limitations for the 9P code. Mm -hmm. That if you have drop privileges, it uh, does not reliably uh, drop the access the fi file handle with reduced privileges. Because there's like a 
heuristic matching between the cache of file handles and the V node and who's doing it. And it can happen that you uh, reopen a file, but you get the file handle for a more privileged user. And then you can suddenly do nasty things you're not supposed to be able to do. And yeah, that kind of breaks the assumption. And there are also other limitations of what you can and can't do on 9PFS, um, which means that it's restrictive if you have to use it as a um, local root file system, whereas with VIDIO, FS, in theory, you should be able to use it as a full featured file system. Yeah, and the, I think that uh, can bind sockets into, can bind named pi uh, pipes into, and it just works like a normal file system. In theory, the protocol, at least they claim, supports uh, shared memory and uh, memory map IO, which is certainly neat, but I don't know if we want to go there initially. And if you're prepared to face the lot of issues which come with memory mapped IO. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not, uh, honestly, like I'm not, I haven't really thought about like the exacts on how the, uh, how the server side would work right now. Like I think that mainly right now, like the, the thing I'm focusing on is making sure that the, the driver itself is stable because it is essentially Fuse itself is kind of complex. And from my experience running everything, the essentially slight mismatches between what the server expects mm -hmm. on the host and the and what the guest does is really like causes very subtle bugs. So for mm -hmm. and I'm trying to see like how you know kind of pinpoint them and fix them. After that, for sure, like it would be I think it would make sense to like implement the beehive side. Yeah, so it would make sense to just add to the details of your description that you intentionally limit the scope of this work to the guest driver side mm -hmm. running so that FreeBSD can mount VidIOFS so, uh, as hosted by QEMO, which mm -hmm. is already very valuable because some of the bigger hosters offer this, if I understand mm -hmm. correctly. Yeah. And being or even uh, someone using Linux as their desktop can then use this as a shared folder with much richer semantics than 9P, mm -hmm. which is I also see. valuable for development. So mm -hmm. that are uh, good example use cases you can bring up, like shared folders, uh, also providing mm -hmm. file system level instead of block level storage through this interface. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that's uh, so. I uh, I assume like so. One one the reason I didn't do much of a comparison in the review was also like to not try to compare to like nine p unfavorably, honestly, because you know it's like it's two very different things with very different use cases. That but I, I will mention the differences. Like I, I you know I'll I'll just explain that. It's I totally agree. Use cases. The problem is in the minds of lots of users, for example, the, I want to have a shared folder on my mm. workstation between somewhere in my home gear and the test VM. Mm -hmm. That's a use case which, if it's just data or a Git repository or something in there, which both protocols or which can satisfy. Mm -hmm. But there are things which 9P can do better. And there are a lot of things that OFS, while it's more complex, can do better. Uh, so, yeah. I see. The big advantage is that video 9 p has landed in Tree both uh, as host and server, and especially the server quite a while ago, so that you can just run it in production mm -hmm. uh, releases of Beehive and then run the client on current. Mm -hmm. But with this, you have to have another hypervisor as host, not Beehive, but yeah. FreeBSD as guest, mm -hmm. which 
I would say is still totally on top topic for this all because there is no alternative forum for this that I know of. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I think thank you for the the pointers. Like uh, I'll update. Uh, I will update the description to be a bit more a bit me meaty. And, <laughs> Uh, oh. The problem is that if FreeBSD isn't the host, mm -hmm. you kind of expect that the ones um, who are able to give you valuable uh, comments during a review in FreeBSD's review process are mm -hmm. also familiar with how to set up, up QEMO as a server for this. So it would probably be good to have a little example command line on mm -hmm. how to spin up QEMO on Linux or if it's possible oh. macOS, because mm -hmm. you have quite a few FreeBSD hackers who uh, run macOS on the daily driver and mm -hmm. may be comfortable to run that uh, as a server to test your patches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be um, also be like very useful because I've been testing it only on Linux. And to add to your point about configuration, yeah, uh, in fact, uh, with Virt Manager, which is as far as I can tell, mm -hmm pretty popular for Linux. Uh, sometimes, yeah, and like the thing is, it doesn't actually say, so it spins up the virtiofs device, and if the server fails to boot, uh, it, uh, it actually keeps going, right? So you just mm -hmm. have a file system that doesn't, a device that doesn't respond, and unless you go dig into your logs, you don't know that yep. the, it's not supposed to respond because it's not there. Like, in my case, I was In missing case, a package on Debian. I, I, yeah, I, would, would be, a... it, mm -hmm. I would, as a review, I would like to have, if it's short enough, a few lines to copy and paste into a console, if not a shell script to mm -hmm. test this, so that I don't have to figure out how to use uh, libvirt based tooling to mm -hmm. do it on an operating system I'm already not at home mm. on. That's fair, yeah. Just make it easy for your reviewer so they mm -hmm. don't have to do a lot of tedious, error-prone work before they can get to the point where they're helping your review move forward. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's reasonable, yeah. Because my experience is that people will not complain about you not doing it. You will just be silently ignored. Mm. I see. Yeah. Um. Uh, so on the title, would it simply be to Beehive or to VMM.ko or where does it belong? Uh, so uh, I think that maybe uh, it wouldn't be to VMM.ko itself because it right. would be a separate driver, right? So maybe like Vert.io and then, you know, call on like add, uh, add Vert.io FS device support or something to that effect. Whoops. Like something that shows that it is, it, or maybe even... I don't know if FuseFS would be appropriate for it, like though it does touch on FuseFS, and part of it is in Fuse. So maybe maybe that would help a bit more. Um, yeah, I think either Virta or FuseFS. Or in parentheses, Vert IO FS, because that's not. So if you. I don't know, but yeah, you see that. Just yeah, just make it as clear as possible. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the, the issue, especially if we have it. So maybe Vertio Fuse file system, something like that. And does it only apply to Beehive within FreeBSD or can it be used on the host without, regardless? Like, could you connect? I, it can work with uh, like any hypervisor that supports Vertio FS. So it's, it's hypervisor. Oh, so with, as FreeBSD you know, as a guest would support it, correct? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yep. Just reminding myself here and. Just, Stating the obvious, okay. This work is about making sure that FreeBSD as a guest under a hypervisor which supports yep. this VIDIO FS device can make use of it and mount the file system. Okay. This is not about adding the server for this protocol. Yeah, I, I need that reminder. <laughs> yeah, if I understood Emil's uh, explanation yes. of his work correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if I can type. Uh, client support. I'm just making a note to us collectively. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe just spell out uh, 
vert IO and, you know, just in parentheses up there, vert IOFS, which if that's a common name, just use that and disambiguate. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, I hope that helps. Yeah, a lot. And Thank you very much. Similarly, Hans, um, for example, mentioned that you need the TPMSW, whatever it's named, package. Maybe give the context of like, well, I think it was 14 gave TPM support. Thank you, Corvin. Um, and uh, and again, feel free to just type in add support in reviews.freebsd.org. And I gave I came up with some examples just right off the bat. I don't know if they're great examples, but then just look through a dozen or so of those and see if they uh, match the type of work you're doing or subsystem and just see if it meshes in nicely. Um, one more yes. thing. Yes. I, I tried the uh, huge setting of um, SWTPM and that does not work on FreeBSD. It's compiled oh, in, it's failing. So the support is there, it's apparently for Linux. And there are differences between Linux and FreeBSD as far as I can understand. So it can be Have you so loaded the Q's kernel module? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> there you go. That's why we're talking. Named, it used to be named Q's for BSD, but I think it's only called Q's these days. So yeah, it's the same thing. It's uh, it's starting up and then it says Fuse unknown option FS name equals Q's. And what I gather from Googling this error message is that it is Linux specific. So it's probably not something that is too hard to fix, but it doesn't work out of the box. Interesting. Can you run uh, LDD on the uh, program and check if it has a uh, link time dependency on, sorry, runtime dependency on libqs? I can do that, yes. So because of it link against no, nope, it links lip fuse. Maybe that links lip fuse one way or another. Probably not. He should recursive uh, compute the transitive hull of all uh, library dependencies. Um, yeah, all he does that. Um, as far as I know, does it not? It it doesn't see things uh, if you use DL open at runtime. Of course, that's yeah, that, that is obvious. If they, uh, for example, used uh, DL open to make it an optional runtime dependency. Wait, someone who knows this can probably fix SWTPM to work with queues and FreeBSD. The last but, quick question I would have is, are you running the TPM server as root? Yes, of course. There's okay. strictly there's no necessity to do that. It could be any user as long as it, it can create a socket and the state files or the log file and whatever it needs. Because, just asking because you have to be root by default to create a queues device, and that would be an easy explanation if you're running as your normal everyday user. Anyway, it doesn't work. <laughs> so that's what I Thanks want. Thanks for testing that. That would have been too easy, wouldn't it? Yes. Hans, Hans, do you have a chat system of choice, be it Signal, Skype, Telegram, or the 50 others? IRC. IRC, okay. Um, uh, yeah, feel free to, uh, Jan and Hans, feel free to connect as appropriate for simple questions like that, because I'm sure you'll run into countless previous isms that are just are not familiar to you. Okay, so I've I've... I've drafted just a, a way framework primitive uh, suggestion of a review, Hans, of like just some points like, uh, and I'm happy to review the text before you post it if you mail it to me. And, and I'd say it's with a project like this, it's safe to put up a review that says, hey, this is not ready yet. Um, uh, we need to get we need to resolve some questions and we should do that in public. So uh, for example, it's easy to forget that it depends on the the software TPM package. And um, I think you might want to link to that. You may want to mention the fact that there's the TPM pass through. So at least the topic is on the radar of FreeBSD users in general. Um, and I think we've established that while this is of most interest to those virtualizing Windows 11 on FreeBSD, and 
in Lumos, there could be uses for the TPM outside of that, be it for ZFS um, keys I could or see SSH users keys. for the queues uh, device to be useful in a jail so that you run the queues, uh, the TPM in one jail and the device in another, um, or use the device in another. Um, And you know, Hans, you are welcome to simply draft the review in the document here, use this, and we can all kind of chime in. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing it openly. Um, ba, 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 libera chat. Well, I've no, no, that's play. just uh, it's, it's idle really... on IRC. And okay, finding good. expectations that FreeBSD community has when it comes to reviews, where they might differ from the rumors. And Document those. I mean, yeah. you know, we are finding, uh, thanks to many factors, many Linux refugees and having them, you know, ex uh, experiment with our communities is, uh, is extremely valuable and we need to make it as easy as possible for them. So a blog post or otherwise about the differences between the Illumos and the uh, FreeBSD review processes is absolutely valuable so do interface one and one on one as appropriate um rod i wouldn't be surprised if you're caught up in other calls at the moment um hans shoot me your hours to date and emil i hope that helps with your review and stepping back wow this is an amazing amount of progress on all all fronts so thank you everyone who's and making that possible when it yes, comes yes. to running all of this insanity we mentioned today yes uh instead <laughs> of jade beehive yes i have a um preview uh open to uh, support executable j.conf snippets so that right. you can um have dynamic parts like uh, DevFS rule set creation and, or rule set allocation and configuration um, to be part of uh, your jail.conf so that you don't have to template it out initially and then have to use some external wrapper around the jail command to bring it up instead. Uh, because this, some of this has to be part of the general configuration, you can use a shell script or whatever language you prefer to uh, emit a jail.conf snippet. It can be as simple as one or two variables. To stand it out, it will be passed as if it was the actual content of the file. And as long as your command exits with um, exit code of zero and uh, closes the pipe, everything is good. Do you, you have that link handy? Standard. I'll try to yeah, find it the in the, the uh, jail doc. Uh, oh, that was it. Okay. That. So that said, um, I I uh, will say be like Jan and market your review. I believe, Jan, your review started as a PR, which is probably not the best place for it. And then you got nagged into making it into well, a review. Uh, and now you've posted the a review. Different feature. That's a different one? Okay. I'm losing track that of all the amazing to things fill going the, on. Um, the jail.conf output from uh, jail-e -E separator so that you can oh, the dump the e variables one. Yes. out. Correct. Uh, instead, it, um, also the parameters out, it will now be able to filter so that you can specify which jails configuration you run. You don't have to pass out the ones you want to, which because you get it as a flat output, it's probably most useful to just dump a single jail. And then you don't have to deal with parsing out where one jail's configuration begins and the next ends from a flat list of key value pairs by just knowing that a jail starts at a GID or a name equals line and have to also uh, unquote multi-line strings because you can have a line starting with variable name equal, which is okay. still part of a multi-line string, which gets ugly quickly. 
But this feature is very useful because it can be used to save your uh, jail configuration during mm -hmm. jail startup. And if you fat finger your configuration and delete the configuration before you um, stop the jail, you still have a backup of the effective configuration values so that you can do a clean shutdown of your jail, stuff like that. Okay, executablejail.conf, okay. So for what it's worth, Emil and Hans, there's an oh, example can... review from a Deutschlander. And it's not just, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it's a perfect review, so to say, but um, I just got badgered into um, putting it online for people to comment on instead okay. of just yapping about my ideas uh, in a ah. vacuum. How has the feedback been, if any? Car okay, Kay Evans. Hey, Carl Evans already uh, gave me feedback on some just... Uh, styling uh, questions and he um, reserved comment on if it's a good idea, I addressed his changes and uh, followed the uh, FreeBSD style more okay. closely. Well, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Which was total. I don't even if I like to uh, do things a bit different, it should be consistent with the rest of the jail command uh, yep. style to make it more readable for others. And if anyone okay. else has feedback on that, please comment. Yes, yeah, so we've covered a lot of ground here. Anything else at this time? Uh, thank you all for your amazing contributions. And yeah, uh, just let's stay in touch as appropriate. And I guess I'll see you next week. Oh, Jan, do you want the honors? Like and subscribe. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.